uh, we're still open for questions. But um, while we're waiting for them, um, I would like to um, read some of the comments that um, that they uh, that some of our um, attendees um, posted a while ago um, in relation to the first part of our discussion. First is um, somebody commented that um, if one is not too young to learn freedom of expression, then one is not too old to learn about it either. <laughs> And then again, of course, sometimes it's more difficult to teach old dogs new tricks. So, yeah. Anyway, there's also somebody who commented on Facebook um, that didn't colonization suppress freedom of expression, the freedom of expression of our ancestors, such as replacing the, our way of writing, our alphabet, um, imposing their own um, system, uh, writing system to our ancestors. Oh, I, de definitely. Uh, I, when I was talking about the relative success of uh, the American colonial experiment. I was not praising colonization. I was just trying to describe the reality of our history. Uh, of course, uh, uh, having a colonial power, having any authoritarian uh, regime uh, run a country uh, means repression of our uh, fundamental rights. Uh, even though it's in the constitution, for instance, in the 1943 constitution under J the Japanese or the 1973 constitution under Marcos, uh, constitutional guarantees do not uh, enact themselves. Uh, we have to fight for them. Um, so even though there were guarantees in previous Spanish constitutions under Spain, um, It was truly the dark ages for, for, uh, for the Philippines. Uh, it seems uh, that uh, the Americans were more successful as colonizers because they uh, allowed uh, their colonial subjects uh, more participation in the political and uh, economic systems. But the fact is um, they had occupied our country. Uh, they had betrayed uh, us uh, in uh, 1899 and had occupied our country for 50 years. They should not have been here in the first place. So definitely colonization uh, includes, in fact, is predicated on repression of basic rights. But looking at our own history, uh, our heroic generation in the 19th century, for instance, or our World War II generation uh, rose to uh, the occasion, so to speak, uh, when their backs were to the wall, uh, there is a, I'm trying to remember, there is a, uh, a letter, one of the letters, there's a letter from Rizal to Marcelo H. Del Pilar, where he says that we must work, uh, something like, uh, we must be worthy of our suffering. Uh, what he meant was, uh, I think, what he meant was that we should be able to uh, overcome what we're going through, uh, perhaps by turning uh, the very weapons pointed at us, like the Spanish language, mastery of the law, uh, the need for advanced degrees, uh, turning these weapons around and point them at the Spanish colonial authorities. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, Sir, um, there's also a comment um, by Tony Aquino um, that there is no practical difference between speech and expression. Um, their cognitive rights, along with assembly for redress, an act can actually be both the burning of the can be both the burning of the flag is protected speech under American jurisprudence. I guess it's um, I, I guess sir, it's just a matter of maybe no not, not much difference, but maybe expression is um, a broader concept. Slightly, because speech is actually about you know the words that you use, but you know like that he did mention burning of the flag, which is actually an act. It's it's an expression. So dances, um, songs. Yes, it's a speech act. Yes, I, thank you for the clarification, uh, Attorney uh, Aquino. Um, I, I referred earlier to uh, uh, some scholars. It's not a scholarly consensus, but some scholars prefer to use freedom of expression as the umbrella term. 
uh, and I, that's a preference that I agree with because it helps us push back against the American emphasis on free speech. Like I said, we can, like the, our old Supreme Court, embrace the rich and influential uh, jurisprudence on free speech in the US, but uh, maybe we can add our own contributions under a broader umbrella term of freedom of expression. Um, sir, there's a question here again for Mr. Michael Yusingo. Um, he's asking that, um, do you agree that free speech should be treated by Filipinos less as a constitutional norm that needs to be enforced by a judicial action, but more as a constitutional value that should guide citizens on how they live their civic life? I think I should ask uh, uh, Attorney Yusingo to, um, to host the next uh, forum in the learning series. Uh, he'll have much better, uh, more historically grounded um, answers uh, than I would. Um, certainly because as I pointed out, there might be an overuse of uh, the legal language, of legalistic language when we talk about freedom of expression. We need to push the pendulum back uh, and look for other ways to understand freedom of expression. Uh, we had an earlier comment, again, uh, an ex excellent comment about uh, embracing um, freedom of expression as a moral virtue. Uh, right now we're talking about freedom of expression as a constitutional virtue. Uh, Again, I would like to think that we would have a lot to learn uh, from uh, Bonifacio, Jacinto, and even uh, Apolinario Mabini um, talking about uh, um, whether moral virtues or constitutional virtues. Um, but because there is that overemphasis on uh, legal language, I welcome the opportunity to speak of freedom of expression using other languages. And if that language is the language of ethics or the language of psychology or the language of sociology, uh, so much the better. All right. Um, I think there are no more questions, sir. I think we've answered all of them so far. <laughs> so wala nang pahabol. Um, okay, sir, thank you very much. I think one of the, personally, one of the, I think, um, things that would, that would strike me in this discussion, in, in your lecture this afternoon, is really more on the idea of um, ceding one's power, um, one's, ceding one's right, or ceding one's power. So really, um, there is, um, with, with one's, you know, with one's right, there's also that you know, um, other side of it that you, your, your right can always be um, um, surrendered to. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the things I learned uh, preparing for this uh, forum, and I really thank Wolfgang Bea and Bernie Carey for the opportunity, uh, was uh, getting to know uh, Wesley Hofield's uh, analytical framework. Uh, I think it helps us understand exactly what, for instance, the Anti-Terrorism Act does to our freedom of expression. It attacks freedom of expression as a claim and as immunity. And because it attacks both, it diminishes our use of our privilege of freedom of uh, expression. Uh, so it's a complex of rights. Freedom of expression is not a simple right. It can be understood in many different ways. In this particular instance, with whole field, we can look at it as a complex of rights, privilege, claim, power, immunity. And draconian laws like the ATA undermine, in fact, subvert the claim right and the immunity right. And we end up failing to put in practice this fundamental freedom of expression. 
I think it's um it's it's also um I think in, in more practical terms it's looking at it in terms of the anti-terror law creating a chilling effect meaning you know it kind of scares you into into silence versus um what happens uh, but it, it's not really freedom of expression anymore but you know versus um surrendering certain rights that we have in relation to controlling the pandemic I think that's that's how you know that that's how complex I think and complicated it is to to try to create to try to differentiate you know how how these um, factors play in in the general scheme of things. Well, 